here. And uh, let me say the usual things. You know, if you want to contribute, that's fine. This is not a class, it's not a webinar. If you have something to say, I think if you, oh, hang on, there's another setting I need to do, if I can remember. How and where, when else do I do it? Yeah, no. Oh, okay, it may not work for us. Um, trying hard. To, oh, okay, so there is a setting where when you speak, uh, you will appear as an icon. Uh, otherwise, it's just me, and I don't want just me. Anyway, back to what I was saying, folks, which is please contribute if you want to. If you put your hand up, I'll see that, and I can click on you and convert you to a panelist, or at least convert you to being able to speak. And everyone will hear you. Don't be daunted by that. That's the whole point of a discussion group. Okay, so we're up and running. I've got the recording going. So, welcome to the almost Mr. Ho Sunday meeting, and it was such short notice. Uh, it's rather sad, and I nearly fluffed it, but of course, people will get to see the recording. Uh, for those of you who come on later, I'm here in Bordeaux in the southwest of France. In fact, we're, we're leaving tomorrow. We've been here for a very few, a few pl very pleasant days. It's a great eating and drinking center, uh, you know, very rich and uh, very prosperous. A lot of foreigners, though, you know, many, many immigrants and different communities here, all of which like to participate in the French life. And you can see why it's great fun. So uh, you can probably guess I'm sat in a hotel room doing this. Uh, and I hope that's okay with you. It's a plain, simple room that you can't see nine tenths of it anyway. So it shouldn't be an issue. So again, welcome. And this is Dr. Keith. And this is our Sunday meeting. Uh, again, I don't want to give it religious overtones, that sort of ceremony and routine, what's the word, ritual, none of that. But nevertheless, being Sunday, let's keep some spiritual ideas going. Now, what is spiritual? I mean, you know, it could, that could cover a lot of ground. Um, anything to do with spirit and the greater life? It certainly doesn't have to be in nature, you know, Christian or Buddhist or Islam. Uh, just be aware of the bigger life that we all lead. And there are, are lots of pathways to that. I wanted to actually start with something that triggered a thought today. I was walking along and thought, oh, I'd like to bring that up and see what the group feel about that. Uh, on the street, on the waterfront, in a busy, prosperous port, in a wonderful city, there was a man who was... I guess, bordering on starving. He was going through garbage in a garbage can. He pulled out some half-eaten pizza. And I've got to say, a slight, slightly ashamed feeling. I turned away. I thought, eh, how can he eat that stuff? Eh. And then, you know, we, as we continued to walk, I realized, well, of course, the reason he could is because he had to. He probably had no other source of food. Uh, and was forced into what the Americans call dumpster diving, but it was really only the litter bin. We were in a part of town with lots of cafes, so probably a lot of people threw out food garbage. And here was a poor fellow human being who was faced with being extremely hungry or eating stuff that, you know, with the rest of us had thrown away. And it really did set me thinking. You know, there's a lot of people talking cliches about the difference between very rich people and very poor people and how the gap is just getting wider and wider. And I couldn't help but think of Jeff Bezos, the guy that started Amazon. I don't like him. I don't consider him uh, an authentic human being. I think he's a rascal, if not a crook. Certainly the way he runs Amazon is not honest. He tends to cheat his... Uh, salespeople, never mind his customers. I don't like him, but he's very rich. And in today's world, being rich is often all you need. If you're really, really super rich, then nobody's much going to question your morals or what you're doing. If you're worth millions, hundreds of millions, you must be a clever person. Therefore, we'll leave you to it. Uh, it's not true that you must be a clever person. And as I said, I don't think he did it honestly, really. But anyway, the last figure I saw for him was that he was worth 150 billion. Uh, 
somebody said, I think an, an article somewhere claimed that that had doubled in because of COVID, you know, everybody was shopping online and this had boosted Amazon's sales. I was willing to believe that, but let's stick with the, the authentic figure, you know, I got from the Wall Street Journal, one of those, that he was worth $150 billion. There are seven and a half billion people on the planet, shall we say. So I did a bit of quick maths and I'm crap at maths. So if anyone wants to correct me, please do it in chat and say, no, 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 doc, this is the, the actual figure. But I did a bit of quick math in my head. And I reckon that means seven and a half billion people, 150 billion in personal fortune that Jeff Bezos has snatched about $20 off on average from every human being on the planet. Uh, I don't say he's got it as money in the bank, but he's got it as assets. He's got it as wealth. Every single person has given him, or on average has given him $20. So, I mean, no wonder he's rich. These people, you know, Facebook, Amazon, Google, they're all kind of parasites on society. They're living on the internet world and they're scraping off the top of everything that goes on. And they're really like parasites. It's like an extra tax. You know, we all have to pay it. Anyway, this is my first question for you folks. This Jeff Bezos character is 150 billion or more. And I thought about him standing next to a man who didn't have any food. He was scrounging from a trash bin to try and find something that might be eligible. As I said, with a slight sh sense of shame, I, I just kind of walked on and I th thought, you know, should I go back, help him, <laughs> help him find the best bits of pizza or give him five euros or what? Uh, actually, I thought it'd be nice to take a picture of him and give him five euros. Anyway, when we turned around, he'd gone. Um, and that person went through my life just like a flash. But uh, Jeff Bezos has got such unimaginable wealth and this person has none. <clears throat> it can't be right, can it? I mean, we can't argue philosophically well the rules of the game are the same for everybody and you know Jeff Bezos happened to know the rules and exploited them or he was in the right place at the right time uh, I don't think any of that washes we're all brothers on the planet together we're all you know we're all human beings we all share the same air the same ground to walk on we all look at the same sun every day and worship the same moon at night when she's shines down benevolently we're all in it together in other words so why should this guy have such vast amounts of money i don't think i'm minding being a multi-millionaire or even worth you know maybe a hundred million if he's done something really good but 150 billion to him alone uh, that seems a bit odd now uh, i'd like you to anyone to comment should should he hand it around is it you know is it a, a duty a rightness as a human being that he should share or is he entitled to say look i earned it it's my plan i came together with the idea for amazon it took off and everybody has you know used it it's been useful to all of mankind people have uh, effectively donated to my operation i and he, he he can say this and i've been hugely beneficial to mankind in the sense that people can now shop easily conveniently it can be dropped to their door. I've done a great service, therefore I'm entitled to $150 billion. Or should he be giving some of it or most of it away anyway? I, I know that, uh, that Facebook guy, what's in there? Mark Zuckerberg gave away five, I think it was 500 billion, just gave it to charity. I don't know which charity. I'm sure he picked extremely unwisely and politically correct probably vanished into one of the cancer charities or something. They all up their salaries and uh, continue to avoid getting any solution to the problem. Uh, I don't, so as I say, I don't know what, but the thing is Mark Zuckerberg gave all this money. It was a big public relations thing. <clears throat> He'd got it back in a year. He's making so much money, he's making it hand over fist that Facebook is now worth treble what it was in the days when he gave away all that money but anyway the question would somebody like to contribute a comment if, if you want just put it in chat or q a and i'll read it for you but do you think this is right should uh, should things be distributed more evenly i mean i'm not talking about the guy should have a conscience he hasn't 
So if he hasn't got a conscience, what do we do? We just have to put up with him being a parasite on society. Is that, is that right? Is that the kind of spiritual religious point of view or should we, should we sort of try and pin him down and try and talk to him and try and get him to see things differently? The trouble is you can never ever change a person's mind by just argument and reason and rationale. It just, it just doesn't work, does it? So it would end up in a very tough confrontation where we'd get nowhere. Or maybe, you know, he'd get shamed by the media somewhere and they'd get, agree to give away a bunch of money. But who gets it? You know, if you give it to a charity, well, certainly American charities, 95% uh, of the money doesn't go to the cause. It goes to the people running the charity. They draw huge salaries. They're legally allowed to do so. You know, I mean, huge, probably, uh, you know, in the millions uh, as an, an authentic salary. They pay tax on it, of course. Uh, but it means the money's not really going where it should. I'd rather see, how to, let's say we can talk him into giving away $1 billion. I'd rather see every person get $5 out of that. Uh, and I don't want any, of course. I've got plenty. Lots of people have got plenty. But people like the man who was trying to find a piece of edible pizza in the trash can. Uh, he could have done a lot with five dollars. I think he could probably live on that for a week. And even if he didn't, he could go and buy himself a super pizza, eat it, and then he's got a nice full stomach feeling for lasting for several days, probably. What do you think? Anyone want to say anything or contribute something? Mm. Oh, come on. <laughs> Help me out here. <laughs> I, well, I don't need helping in the sense that, you know, if you don't do this, I'm going to fall flat on my face. I'm just hoping to stimulate conversation. So if I'm not, then I'm in that sense, I'm failing. But look, you might think, well, what the hell's that got to do with a Sunday meeting? You know, I come here for some spiritual uplifting thoughts. But as I realized this morning with Viv, when I was, you know, making a few comments, why not? There's a very famous story of sharing food. You know, we all know it, the feeding the 5,000, the five loaves and two fishes or whatever it was, or was it? Seven, no, anyway, whatever, you know the story, uh, where a large number of people was miraculously fed on a very small amount of resources. So I don't think I'm off the wall in saying this is a subject of spiritual importance. Should we be redistributing wealth a little more? The trouble is that the people who've got it seem very uninclined to share, don't they? I mean, when they've got it, uh, the next thing they do is try and create the rules or get into a position of power where they can protect the rules that protect them and allow them to do whatever. And here in a, a very powerful medieval city, parts of this city go back forever. In fact, they go back to Roman times. In medieval times, there was the same, same kind of story. I mean, they the huge ultra mega rich landowners had everything. The peasants had nothing. They worked their ass off. And most of the money went to pay the rich landlord and they had a little bit left for themselves, just enough to get them through the winter to the next summer so they could start working their butts off again. So, I mean, is this how it should be? Uh, okay, somebody here, with, I won't share your name then if you're a bit shy. I don't always say a lot, but I also do not like most charities because of exactly what you stated. Yes, it's true. Uh, you know, it's very tempting to say, oh, I don't give to charity. Uh, I think you should, or we should, or we should be willing to share, but choose very carefully. I mean, the anti-cancer charity is one of the ugliest and most crooked in the world. Their manifesto is we're helping search for cures for cancer. They're not. They're helping suppress every possible cure so that they can go on with their super well-paid jobs for decades to come. The last thing they want is a cure for cancer. So they're just dishonest. Um, all right. So uh, Kim has said a, a very important point. Thank you, darling. I, I totally agree. That's the point I'm aiming towards, really. Can you do it by force? I just don't think it works. You know, you're talking communist revolutions and things. People against the world, against the wall and mass shootings and murders. I don't like that. That's not really a solution. Uh, it, it kind of worked, kind of. 
here in France, you know, they had a re famous revolution in 1789 and they guillotined lots of people, including, you know, around here, there was, there's a square where they, they chopped off over 300 heads in the revolution. Uh, now I know the French aristocracy were really bad. I mean, really, really, really bad. They were walking around in diamond encrusted shoes, diamonds on their coaches and liveried horsemen and more food than they ate and drank until they threw up and then started again. They were disgusting human beings, stepping over the dead and dying when they went outside their door. And they weren't about to do anything about anything. So you can see the measure of a desperate peasant or city dweller. They had no money and there were these rich people just lording it over them and not paying the slightest bit of attention. Their answer was, well, it had better be by force because otherwise they're going to do nothing. So they started rioting, as you know, and eventually took control and eventually started what was called the, uh, the reign of terror. I have to apologize again, by the way, I touched the table and that makes the camera rock or jiggle, I'm sorry. Uh, there was actually a, a very moving monument here that Viv and I went to see a few days ago to a bunch of revolutionaries who were kind of kind-hearted and moderate. They were saying, well, you know, it's great that we have a revolution, let's take the money off the rich and spread it around somewhere. I don't like all this beheading and all this killing, that's natural, that's not Christian, that's horrible. Uh, and so Robespierre, leading the revolution, grabbed them and had them guillotined as well. So they're now local martyrs, the, the moderates, the gentle persons of this region uh, who tried to stand up to the revolution and the, the sort of murderous rampage that ensued. And it was a bit like that in, in Russia too, wasn't it? Just, you know, killing and slaughtering the aristocracy. But the Tsar was pretty bad. He wasn't about to release any power or rights to the people or anything when they rioted over food and tried to get grains to make bread and things. He had them strung up and hung, you know, hung to death by about a hundred. Uh, so, you know, I, I don't, I can't teach violence. I don't believe in it, but what choices have you got? Well, I just want to repeat what Kim said here, which is true. Uh, that it would be wonderful if wealth was shared wisely, but it must come from the heart, that you really can't force it from government. I don't know if somebody else would like to speak to that and say, well, as far as I know, forcing it from the government is the only way to do it. Otherwise people, you know, Jeff Bezos isn't about to give up his money. Uh, the dudes that own Google, you know, they're, they're also multi, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars a piece they're like another tax on society. They, they scrape something off the top, but that something on a lot of transactions turns into the hundreds of billions. They're not apparently about to give any of it away. I mentioned, uh, for those of you who came late, I mentioned Mark Zuckerberg, who did give away half a, no, 500, 500 billion, I think it was. But, you know, he had it all back in a year or two. He was making so much money. It was an almost meaningless gesture just uh, a bit of public relations in a way. So maybe, maybe it's true that governments are the only way you can force the people to do it. <laughs> but it's, all, it, it's always been an uphill battle because the people that make the laws tend to be the rich people. They don't want laws that get passed that uh, ban them from, you know, from making, look, listen, let's take the US Congress. You know, I live there now, so I've got to have some, awareness of what they're doing but they pass laws to say uh, my kids don't have to pay back their school loans uh, if i even if i only do one term i can have a pension for life <laughs> you know it's permanent they pass all these laws giving themselves rights and privileges and benefits taking them away from the people they're supposed to be serving so i don't think i trust governments to do it but how else uh, as kim says it would be wonderful wonderful if people would just do it from the heart and share wisely. Well, there are people who've done that, but they're a very exceptional minority, but there are outstanding individuals. Uh, I'm, for example, I don't know if you know this, I, I don't know how many of you know, I recognize the names from previous weeks, but how many of you know British history? But for example, in Britain, there was a whole movement based around the Quakers, you know, the, uh, the Society of Friends are there their real name, they were called Quakers because they used to dance until they shook. 
um, and that was their nickname, the Quakers, but they're really called the Society of Friends. And wonderful, gentle people. They were famous for chocolate, by the way, in, the, in Britain. I don't, it had nothing to do with Hershey's, I couldn't tell you. But in Britain, there was a family called Fry's that made chocolate, a family called Round Trees that made chocolate, a family called Cadbury's that made chocolate. Uh, there's at least one other, I can't just think of it quickly. Uh, but they were very humanitarian. They actually built homes for their workers. They set up schools. This was at a time when nobody else got schools. And, you know, they, they were a model of social or responsible behavior. And they showed something very important for the modern world, which is you can be responsible. You can take care of your workers, be kind and be generous and still make shed loads of money. <laughs> These companies were huge. The other group were, were bankers in England. Barclays Bank used to be a Quaker family. Lloyd's Bank in England used to be a Quaker family. I think Lloyd's has got bought up by a Chinese, uh, you know, Hong Kong uh, concern now. But they proved the point that you know, an individual can make a difference and, it, and you don't go poor, you know, for God's sake, if Jeff Bezos was to give away 149 of his billion, 150 billion, I should say, and left himself with a near billion. He's not going to starve, for God's sake. What's the matter with him? I mean, what does he want it for? Power, greed, control. Uh, it's, well, it's a pretty unspiritual subject, shall we say. But, you know, uh, there are lots of stories in the Bible. I, you know, I don't, I don't teach Christian stories. I'm sure you all know that. But I know them, you know, I was raised on those stories and, you know, the prodigal son and the, the story of the five talents, you know, the person, they were each given five talents. One went out and turned that into a million dollars, as it were. I'm making it up, you know. And the other one just squandered the five talents on booze and women. And it's all very moralizing. So because it's all Old Testament, all Jewish stuff, you know, the only acceptable one was the one that turned his five talents into a fortune, you know, he be a good lad, ah, uh, as they might have said. Uh, so there's a lot of moral morality and preaching around the subject of, of getting rich and being successful, but not so much about sharing it. You know, sometimes the term charity comes up uh, and sometimes people do their thing. Like I said, the Quakers were famously kind and generous families in, in Britain, and they made a big difference. They weren't the only families, you know, there was a, uh, a man in Scotland, uh, he started a, a, he built a whole town called New Lanark. He was a mill owner. Uh, the, the mills, the cotton mills and the fabric, uh, you know, fabric mills and these things, it's all like Dickens said, it was horrible, the working conditions were disgusting, children of six and seven, eight years old were made to work a 20 hour day, it's all true. And there were mill owners like that, but there were also the kind and generous ones. Another one called Titus Salt in the t uh, city of uh, Bradford, uh, well it was near Bradford, uh, Vivian would know exactly where it was. Uh, but Salt famously, he built a village, he built schools, he built a church, he put in roads, spent fortunes on looking after his workers. <laughs> uh, and by the way, I do believe uh, the Hershey's had a go at something like this, but they were rewarded by the fact that the workers ganged up and tried to shoot them. <laughs> so that was not exactly the idea in mind. There's no uh, gratitude there. But in England, there was, of course, a lot of gratitude. And these, these were famous social milestones that were really, in a way, almost passed into history. You know, it's not a 20th century thing so much. Well, I'm saying that, I suppose I've got to mention Henry Ford, haven't I? Because Henry Ford famously looked after his workers. Yes, he made shed loads of money, obscene amounts of money. But his workers were well paid, they were well looked after. And in fact, people used to fight to try and get to work for Henry Ford. The workers' conditions were some of the best in town. And you compare that with Ray Kroc, the guy that bought up McDonald's and started to turn that into a fast food chain. He was one of the biggest crooks. I'm tired of, go I don't go anymore, for not for years, but you go to, uh, you know, success seminars and prosper and 
get on in life. To, and they're all, you know, quoting these, you know, Ray Kroc, oh, he made millions and millions. That guy was a criminal jerk. He cheated his workers. He didn't give them proper safety conditions. If somebody got injured, and that was very common because they were working in extremely dangerous conditions, you know, with the meat cutters and mincers and potato slices and so on. People always got injured. He'd very kindly send them round a company lawyer whose job it was to delay the claim until it was out of time. That's the kind of villain <laughs> built McDonald's. And he's not done any of as much good since then either. But I'm just con sort of contrasting that kind of crooked exploitation, which is not necessary with what some other people are doing uh, that showed that you can be prosperous, you can do well, you can keep your peace with God because you're not being a crook and you can take care of others. So go figure, you know, why do the Google guys and Zuckerberg and Jeff Bezos need to be so goddamn greedy? Well, actually, I'm, I'm, I'm almost shutting myself in the foot, aren't I? Because it's famous that Google really, really looks after their staff. I mean, they get fabulous holidays, they have creches for free, they've got something like 20 restaurants that the staff can eat at. In fact, their general work ethos is to try and make it so good at work that nobody wants to go home because <laughs> you get more productivity out of people that way. So, you know, I shouldn't use that as an example of greed, but it is an example of what I mentioned early on, which is kind of scraping something off the top of the entire economy like a second tax. We all pay a second tax to uh, the Google guys and Zuckerberg and so on. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, okay, so let like, anyone and and okay, I'm not quite sure. Uh, Wally, would you clarify a little bit? True, but they want all the money they can get. Yes, that's what I'm saying. And keep my thought. Uh, so you you need to further explain that those last three words. I didn't. Uh, I'm not quite getting it. Anyway, listen, we've come a long way from watching a guy <laughs> scrounging rotten pizzas out of the dustbin. Uh, I didn't want to spend all the time on that, but it does seem to me to lead into deeper thoughts. You know, you can't always just do pretty thoughts, you know, and it's all sweet, and beautiful, and the angels and heavenly music. Isn't life wonderful? Sometimes you've got to get down there and face the dirt and the filth and the crap that's out there because it's out there and unless somebody goes out and confronts it and rolls their sleeve up it's gonna it's gonna stay that way again i'm you know i'm not a christian i'm not teaching christianity but this famous story isn't there of christ going into the temple of the money makers and throwing the table saying get out of here what are you jerks doing in here this is supposed to be a religious place and you're just a greedy bunch of sharks I don't know all the details of the story. I haven't heard it for 50 years, but something like that, isn't it? Uh, so, I, like I say, we've managed to milk a little bit of mileage just out of seeing somebody with not enough money for food. Uh, I don't know that we've actually answered the question. We'd like people to do it out of kindness and generosity. And I know, you know, from my sort of encyclopedic readings over the years that some people have done it. And it does work for them. And, the, you know, the, the New Lanark Mill, of, I've forgotten his name, uh, and Titus Salt's Mill, they're all still there. Titus Salt's Mill is now like a giant mega shop, you know, like a mall in its own right, uh, where there's, you know, there's furniture, you can buy books, you can buy ornaments, uh, you see exhibitions there. Uh, they, uh, now what was that? That painter was a friend of his, the painter that he did all the swimming pools. Uh, Vivian, help me please, down. Vivian's downstairs so that she's not using bandwidth here in the room, um, which is, thank you, yeah, well done, darling. But uh, who, who was his name? Uh, Hockney, that's it. I knew it was David something. David Hockney was a, was a pal of the people that now run the Salts Mill, and he's exhibited there. So, you know, it's, it's a very much a modern phenomenon now. In its day, it was a mill, meaning it was processing wool and fabric. Wool was the big thing. A lot of people got very rich on wool in Britain. For some reason, I think they had better wool than the Dutch, the Germans, and the French, probably to, you know, the rather harsher northern climate. So English wool was very much sought after. And some people made a lot of money. And you can still see in towns like Huddersfield and Bradford and 
Halifax, you can drive around and see these huge, almost palatial homes. That, you know, they've been empty of wealthy people for over a century, but they're still there. Many are now uh, apartments, but it's a sort of monument of that day and age. And it wasn't just a 19th century greed thing, by the way. The wool success went right back to medieval times. British wool was just, you know, the best wool you could get for the longest time. Um, anyway, okay, so like I said, that's, I've squeezed about as much juice as I can out of that particular orange. But I did want to talk to, about something else. Let me just take this and move on. If you want to say, oh, okay. Oh, I'm getting it right. So while he's now clearing, it seems like almost all companies in the USA want all the money they can keep. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's, that's true, isn't it? And that most of them have got more, far more money than they need. The modern internet phenomenon, I mean, the whole point is that it's, it's bonds to connect somebody electronically. And there's a bit of software, you know, you, it's just software, it's dots and dashes. You don't have to give them anything, you know, just download it and use it. And yet you can sell it and resell it for fortune. So the profits are obscenely vast. And if you're making cars, you know, you sell them for whatever, but you've got to, you've got to make the car, <laughs> that costs money. So you're only left with the difference. But the guys on the internet, like Google and so on, they make everything. It doesn't cost them a cent. So they could share quite a lot more than they do do. And I just, you know, wish we'd see more of that. Okay, thanks for the clarification, Wally. Now, the other thing that's been happening here, what's happening all over the world, uh, you know, is this COVID thing. Now, Viv and I were very delighted to come to France because it's really open, you know, it's, there's partying, people on the streets having fun, the restaurants are open, and you know, it's some of the tables you sat like this next to somebody in a bar or in a restaurant, social distancing, <laughs> get out of here, this is France, right? We do food, we do drink, we love life, la bonne vie, we're not putting up with any of that stuff. Well, of course they had to, like everybody else, but uh, Macron has released the rules considerably here so it's like one big party at the moment in France contrasted with Britain where they're still suffering and I mean suffering hooey you know uh, they you you, you want to go into a shop then they want to pour this antiseptic filth on you I just refuse if I said no, no I just I was in the toilet 20 minutes ago and I washed my hands with soap that that's not good enough I'm not coming in the shop and we turned away and walked out of shops several times for that reason in Britain, the obsession seems to be with putting the antiseptic on your hands. In the US, the uh, obsession, I think, was more with masks. Uh, and France is, all they're left with is masks. You know, if you get on a bus, you, you do, listen, I've got one in my pocket. I got tired of paper masks, they hurt. So I bought myself a nice fabric one just to get on and off buses. Uh, it doesn't do any good. It's an absolutely stupid joke. But, you know, I want to use the buses or the tram system, I should say. So, you know, we've got no choice. But that's the only place where really there's much enforcement. But, you know, imagine a shop saying, you know, you must put this stuff on your hands. And then you go in and handle their silk fabrics and their leathers with all this stuff on your hands. Uh, and of course, that my objection is that this stuff is actually more toxic than viruses, really. Think what you're doing to your liver, putting this stuff on your hands. I, I always point out that women absorb cosmetics through their skin, which surprises a lot of women. But why should it? You know, you put hormone patches on your ass, you know. The reason is because it goes straight through the skin and there you are, you've got your hormones. So you put this stuff on your hands, straight through your skin, and then it's a problem for your liver. Your liver has to deal with it. It's not going to do any harm to viruses anytime soon. I mean, what about all the ones on the back of your hand or the ones in your head or the ones floating around in the air that land in your eyes? I go, you know, never mind them. So it's nothing to do with the viruses. The real problem is that we're poisoning ourselves and people sooner or later are going to have to pay the price. Anyway, the point I'm trying to raise, I don't want to sound too waffly tonight, but really is the subject of <laughs> current thinking, I suppose, current dogma. And I want to quote George Orwell. I hope you all know who he is. He's the guy that famously wrote the book 1984. And that was about a dystopian world where people were told what to think. They actually had thought police. You're not allowed to think that. We have it all now. Of course, it's here. You know, if you want to think certain things, um, Facebook will delete you. You're not allowed to think those things. Um, uh, 
all of them. Uh, I'm not so much, I've not got any experience of Instagram, but, but Facebook will take you down. Google will uh, censor you. Uh, Twitter is making a lot of noise now because they're taking down and blocking anyone who's associated with a particular website because they are, they're commenting and saying things that are not correct. You must not say these things. So it's exactly what George Orwell foresaw. Well, he wrote the book back in the 40s, I'd just like to point out. And it's a world much like ours that he portrayed. They, for example, they were redefining words. I'll, I'll put the book down, I'll come to his quote in a minute. Um, but they redefined words, you know, freedom means slavery, uh, war means peace, and truth means falsehood, you know, and things like that. And they kept grinding this out and out and out in all the media and over and over until people began to believe it. And they actually bought into this crap. And I see this happening now, and we all do, of course, and you can see it happening. They're talking about the pandemic, the pandemic, what pandemic? There isn't a pandemic, it's not even an epidemic. There's, you know, just the usual, the level is about the same as flu deaths now. It's all being massaged with false figures. I don't want to go into all that. The point is <clears throat> that it's now become uh, correct thinking, if you like. People are only allowed to think correctly, but the correctness comes from the status quo. So again, I'm going to go a bit medieval on you and think back to med medieval times, the old ages when Christianity ruled everything and the church had complete domination and control of the minds of men. You were not allowed to think or say certain things. It was considered heresy. I mean, one of the worst heresies, for example, was that the earth is not the center of the universe. The sun is the center of the solar system, but even the sun isn't the center of the universe. It's just the sun, and we go around and around it. Several people got burnt to death for that. Bruno, uh, what's his name? I've forgotten his name now. A, a very nice uh, Italian monk was a great visionary thinker who was talking quantum physics in the old day. You know, it, vast fields of you know universes and parallel universes out there. They just burnt him to death, poor guy. Okay, uh, somebody else on a mask. If a small percentage in the USA wore Trump 2020 masks, the CDC might come out and say they're no longer required to wear. Well, I've got to say that, and I've got to say this, I'm going political, and you don't need to know who I voted for to know that I, I'm smart. So I can see what's going on, even if it's not my man or somebody else's man, that this, almost everything about this is get Trump the idiot that runs California, the so-called governor, Cuomo in New York, all these criminal morons, they're just out to get Trump and they wanna make things unpleasant. They've blocked California down again. Why? The stats aren't any worse than they were three months ago. It's complete baloney. The answer is they wanna get Trump. This is an election year, so the more trouble they can stir up for people, the more chance there is of getting Trump out. And they don't care if America comes down in flames, so long as they can get him out. So I think that's what this uh, person's comment was about. You know, that is, whatever Trump says, CDC and so on, will we'll just go the opposite way uh, because they want to make him look a fool. And I think he's anything but, actually. He's one of the few presidents that understands business and not politics. Yeah, maybe he doesn't understand politics, but he understands business. If you want to succeed, you've got to make a profit. You can't just raise taxes for more money like that one before him. Idiot, they just want more money, so we'll just put the taxes up. That isn't making money. That's just raising taxes. It solves nothing. Uh, you've got to be able to turn a profit, and I think that's really one of the contributions that Trump had to make. You can't spend money like that. You know, where's he coming from? Who's going to make the money? Where's he going to come from? And he didn't say, well, we'll just raise taxes and you know, take it off the rich suckers. Um, anyway, lost my thread. I'm ranting a little bit. I still haven't read the quote, have I? Let me, let me go back to George Orwell. And it's only short, like two sentences. <clears throat> to, to exchange one orthodoxy for another is not necessarily an advance. So, you know, out with the old and in with the new. 
it's not, it's not necessarily an advancement at all. But this is his telling point. The enemy is the gramophone mind. Lovely expression. I'm going to steal that and use it. The gramophone mind. Whether or not one agrees with the record that's being played at the moment. Well, isn't that what's happening in our world? It's people are taking this COVID thing so seriously. They're running around like this and they'll jump out of your way. Uh, there's mask shaming where, you know, people are scolded for not putting on their masks. Um, they take it so literally. In fact, I read a headline today. This was from a teacher, an educator, believe it or not, said, I want to go back to work. I want to teach children, but I don't want to die. And I believe he means it. You know, this poor moronic idiot who's supposed to be a teacher, but he's clearly a moron, thinks he's going to die just by going to school to teach kids. Hasn't obviously spotted the fact that the only people that are really actually dying are people, people with, you know, heart disease and obesity, diabetes and all those horrible things. Linda, I'm getting to you, darling. Okay, let me just finish. Um, but, the, but it's all about the gramophone mind and it's beginning to work rather horribly. This is the man who wrote 1984. The dystopian world. Uh, let's go and see what the lovely Linda has to say. Come on, sweetheart, uh, contribute something. Everyone must be getting tired of my voice. What do you want to say? Oh, got to, I think I've got to take you off. Uh, I mean, take you on mute. Oh, ask to unmute. Yeah, okay, there you go. Uh, not hearing you. I'm failing to get. Oh, hang on, maybe I can do this for you. Ask, no, I can only ask, ask you to unmute, so you have to unmute yourself, sweet. Hover your mouse on the bottom left and you'll see there's an icon for a microphone which will have a dash through it. If you click on it, then you'll probably then be able to speak. I'm trying to do it for you, but it won't let me. It just says ask to unmute. Uh, okay. Uh, how else can I help you? <laughs> The only way I know, Linda, is that you, you must unmute yourself and the microphone icon is in the bottom left of your Zoom screen. You can even see it. It says, it probably says unmute on yours. It says mute on mine because I'm unmuted. But if you click on it, well, I hope you've got a microphone. Yes, if you, or if you're on a laptop like me, it'll pick you up automatically, but you have to click to unmute yourself. Linda, sweet, I'm going to leave you to figure it out. I want to hear from you, so don't go away, but figure it out. But you've got to unmute yourself. Meantime, I'm going to allow Peter to talk. Uh, he's asked to talk, and uh, I suspect that he may be good. No, no, Peter's muted too. Um, so I'm going to ask you to unmute, Peter. I'm not sure. My, is my laptop working okay? I mean, doing all the things it should. Um, oh, crikey. Maybe I can promote you to a panelist. That might be the way to do it. Uh, promote to a panelist. I'm going to do that for you, Peter. Okay. So you're going to be rejoining the webinar as a panelist, it says. Let's see how we do. Oh, crikey. Yes, you're back, Peter. Probably as a panelist, but you're muted. <laughs> Hello. Oh, yes, hey, male voice, so it must be Peter, breakthrough. It, 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 it was actually a mistake. Oh, I see. Oh, no. I was, trying to do, I was trying to make sense of this Zoom desktop, and I must have pressed something by mistake. Okay, you're forgiven, Apologies. and you're allowed to go. Allowed I can't to get rid of myself off. now. Uh, well, I can mute you. If you I, think, well, I, yes, I can I mute can. my audio. You can probably do your own, but I will. Uh, there you go. So you're muted now. Hi, Raju, I see you there. Um, and it's the first time I've noticed you there. Linda, I don't know how we're doing this, sweetheart. If you can't figure it out, I don't know. Um, you know, the control is there on the dashboard. It's in front of you. If you hover your mouse along the bottom, you'll see various things like chat and participants, probably uh, Q&A chat did I say that but one of them is with a microphone icon and it will say on it will ask you to unmute well of course I suppose it's possible that like Peter <laughs> you, you tripped it by mistake as well 
uh, but it seems I can't help. I, you, I believe that in times past, I was able to unmute people. I'm almost sure I was. But anyway, okay. So listen, let's not delay too long. If you figure it out, then it just blurt out and speak. I'll stop what I'm saying. Um, oh, oh, somebody's saying it's not there. No microphone to unmute. I don't see the mute and unmute buttons. Okay, who's that? Let me just see. Uh, oh, Raju. No, you don't, so you don't see it either. Oh, crikey. Well, let me, I'll do what I just did, which is I'll promote you to a panelist. <coughs> Come and say something, Raju. Just to, you know, give a turn and some variety. Still have to ask you to unmute. Why on earth is all that? So. It must be in some way connected with my laptop. I've never tried it. I don't think I've tried it on the laptop before. I don't remember. I usually do it on the desktop at home. Raju, go for it, please. You're unmuted. Thank you so much, Dr. Keith. Great to see you. Bonjour. <laughs> Bonjour. <laughs> Ça va. <laughs> and namaste. Yeah. I, was, I was thinking back to one of the, the book that you wrote, Virtual Medicine. Yeah. And in that book, you had talked about the fact that everyone has cancer cells, uh, but uh, it's not transmuted to the point where it's visible. That's right. We, we think we all throw off rogue cells, but any good immune system just spots them and just goes and grabs them and gobbles them up. It's only when it becomes, the immune system becomes overwhelmed or compromised that cancer can get ahead. Yeah, so and that's true. So uh, what's your point? Well, I guess sometimes we are so focused on the physical, aren't we? Uh, that we're working at the physical level. And yet the level that we should be working at is a little bit uh, other than the what's visible or what's physical. Oh, yes. Well, I mean, there's a whole, well, my own supernoetics is a whole philosophical system built around the difference between what's supposed to be real and what is actually created within consciousness. And as I said in that book, I hope you remember, but the big hoax is that everyone thinks the real, this is the real world. You know, this is reality, the tabletop, the desks and chairs, that's what's real. Everything else is fantasy. Uh -uh. <laughs> the th thing that's fantasy is the physical real world. It's not there. There isn't anything. And you know, quantum physics has forced this on us that it only ever appears when you look at it. It's called the observer effect. So therefore, the inference is it's created by consciousness and, and viewing. Yeah. Yes, yes. And I, and, I, and I was just thinking back to this this week. I was thinking back to your, your book because it, it, it really set me forth into understanding virtual medicine in a whole different way other than just uh, what is... Uh, physically, uh, what you're looking at and what you're, what you're observing also. Um, uh, but my point was, I was trying to share with, was uh, I've been very, uh, I feel like that uh, in this invisible world, that's where the magic is. Like we, we spend all our time in our senses, but if we were able to t tap into that other side, then we we're going to have a much more effective approach. Right. Well, you're so right. And I, I must talk with you, you know, maybe separately, we'll link up by email sometime in the next few weeks and just tell you how far down that particular road I, I've gone, you know, that we are able to, there is a sort of, uh, I call it, the, you know, the, sub, in supernoetics, we call it sub-reality. Sub but, you know, we're not claiming it as a unique possession. It's a bit like the, the Hindus have something called the Brahman, which is the sort of ground or the consciousness matrix in which everything is stuck, you know, like plums in a plum pudding, <laughs> a bit mm -hmm. like that. That's a bit graphic, but anyway, you get the point. And uh, to me, the real search for life and humanity and the ultimate good is the search in this other world, in the physical world. Well, the physical world will follow the other world anyway. Uh, so that, you know, that's important that we work it out in the, the real world is the one in our consciousness. It's the only reality we have, if you think about it. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's not, it's not even modern, Raj. I mean, it goes back to what were called the British empiricists, John Donne and uh, 
who was a doctor, by the way, uh, the Irish guy, Bishop, uh, uh, early Alzheimer's, this, uh, uh, forgotten his name. <laughs> Uh, gosh, he was uh, Bishop of Dublin. Anyway, they, they were as a group, they were called British Imperialists. And they said the only knowledge you've got of anything to do with the world is what you perceive. And it, it's only you perceive what's out there. There's no proof it is out there. You just perceive something that you think's out there. And it, actually, nobody's ever thought their way around this argument yet. The way I tell this, Raju, is like if there's a you know a group of people in a room and there's a little green man standing by the fireplace, but only I can see him. Everybody else says, "There's no green man here. You're crazy. Get out of here." That's the accepted standard, but it's wrong. Meaning there could be a little green man, and I'm the only person that can see him. Everybody else in the room can't see him, but it doesn't mean he's not there. It's all to do with perceptions. Berkeley, Bishop Berkeley, that's the name I was trying to remember. Bishop Berkeley made a whole big thing about this. That, you know, what you see, what you see is what you perceive, but there's no guarantee that any of that is actually there. Actually, a bit and... deep, a bit deep for this one, <laughs> but you and I should, <laughs> should talk. <laughs> Meg's here, hi darling. I, just want, I want to confirm what you just said, because those apparitions that take place, uh, the, uh, that, that have taken place, like say in France, Apparitions have taken place in some of the uh, holy places. Yeah. And, and in the. I'm not a million the, miles from uh, Lourdes no. here. It's only, only about 100 miles away, Lourdes, down in the yeah. southwest. There you go. Yeah. And so, what people saw, they saw at that time. What you see, you perceive for yourself, that's your reality. Uh, no one can take that away from you. Right, and, and it's actually the only valuable reality. The other one, you know, what everybody agrees on is, I'm going to be rude for it, is bullshit reality. It's not real, it's bullshit reality. Like, because, you know, one day, once upon a time, the, the earth was flat, you know, once upon a time, everything, you know, the earth was center of the universe and the sun went round it. So what everybody agrees is the poorest standard of reality you can possibly imagine. And yet modern science is trying to throttle people into believing the only thing that exists is what we can all see and we all agree is there and actually it's the biggest hoax you remember that famous saying i've used it at least well i'm coming to you meg <laughs> in the in the sunday meeting famous quote by sir james jeans where he said the universe is beginning to look less and less like a big machine and more and more like a giant thought that the universe is a giant thought uh, anyway, it's deep stuff, uh, Raju. I think I'd like to leave it there. Let's see what our friend Megan has to say. Thank you, Dr. Okay, and um, it's some pleasure to hear from you always. Okay, Meg, let's see how it goes with you to unmute yourself, please. Uh, and I hope that... Oh, no, wait a minute. We had a problem, didn't we? I've just been told. I realised I was being told that you can't unmute yourself for some weird reason. Anyway, the solution is I promote you to a panellist which I think I just did. Hope I just did. Is that right? Uh, let, me, let me just try that one more time to be sure. Yes, promote to a panelist and then I can ask you to unmute. And it should work. No. <laughs> oh, golly gee. Yes. Oh. Oh, I think I... Uh, I think I've lost my... Oh, hang on, she's gone into panellists, that's where she is. Oh, no, that's Raju now. Raju and me, I think somehow I've lost Meg, but her name's there. Oh, you know what, folks, it's getting to this time when it's probably time I just shut my mouth anyway. It's been an hour. Um, so on my list of attendees, Megan has disappeared, but she's there on in the gallery as it were uh, Linda let's just have one more crack at this and I'll try and promote you to a panelist see if you can unmute yourself then as a panelist oh Meg's back okay okay oh back on the dashboard anyway no I just don't think it's gone so well for Linda and um, one of your options Linda would be to send it to me in the chat and I'll read it for you 
but honestly, maybe it's time I went, you know, maybe this is <laughs> the cosmos's way of speaking. <laughs> Shut up, Dr. Goho. Uh, is that everything's starting to fall apart rapidly. <laughs> Uh, mate, can you try and speak? I mean, you're not s seeming muted. You're seeming unmuted. Say something to us. Oh, no, it's gone back to muted. Oh, unmuted. Try. Oh, no. Okay, all right, let's wind it down decently, folks. I'm sorry it ended up in a bit of a scramble. I, I thought we were doing quite good, actually, up to a point, and... Uh, but we got we covered some serious and interesting ground uh and i'm sure we did but anyway uh i will figure out why maybe it's something to do with my laptop because my laptop is controlling the session uh no oh, oh hang on i've got four panelists now showing all right so uh I, let me try and un oh, i can only ask to unmute i, I can't do it for you no okay all right folks i know when i'm beat <laughs> and uh i will promise that we'll what these whatever these little problems are you know it's probably more geeks they keep upgrading things to improve okay. things and all all the, ah i hear somebody's <laughs> voice meg it's you hi yeah i i pushed so many buttons here and got so many screens crazy Right. So, did you want to speak? I mean, if it was by mistake. Well, I, I, I would like you to send an email to us with the link to this because I ended up missing the whole thing, even though I was trying the whole time to get on. All right, dear. Yes, of course, I will do that. Uh, I, I do so and I hope very... you're safe and Vivian safe, and you're having a good time. We're having a very good time, thank you, and we feel safe. Uh, I think, you know, the whole world knows that the and uh, I hope Islamic rebellions are often, you know, they often target France for some reason. I don't know why. Uh, people of color and so on are very well tolerated in France, so I don't fully understand it. But we had supper tonight and there were seven soldiers walk through the square carrying machine guns. It makes you feel a little bit uncomfortable. I suppose you could say it should make you feel safe. But anyway, not quite, if you get what I mean. Anyway, that's it for this week, folks, and I shall be back next week, and we'll try and do better, uh, pick a totally different topic, we'll try and stay away from politics and stuff. Uh, Raju, I've got your image, and I've not seen how you look. Now I have. You're a handsome guy. <laughs> All right, everyone, take care. It's been nice. You take and, and, care, too. Yeah, lots of love. Bye now. Bye-bye.